Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I hope all of you are have survived the end of your academic year or are soon to be finished with the end of your academic year. Um, welcome to the webinar. Um, we will get started here shortly. Just a quick reminder, if any of you have um, your phones um, not on mute or you haven't muted um, your screen, please do so. Uh, we are recording this webinar. Um, for those who could not join us today or for any of you who would like to review it or share it with any of your colleagues after uh, participating today. So um, minimizing the background noise is always an important thing, um, as well as not having whatever you're discussing uh, shared with others that you don't know. Um, big thank you to Kate Lawson for uh, um, doing this webinar today. As many of you know, she was originally to present on this topic at the Intimate Partner Violence Summit back at the beginning of March, but the weather that day uh, uh, was not, she was unable to make it as a result. It derailed those efforts. So um, most thankful that she agreed to uh, do this webinar and share this information. As I know, um, it was a workshop that many of you were looking forward to that were there um, and has um, much benefit for our practice as we continue to work to provide safe communities for all of our um, campuses um, across Ohio. Uh, real quickly, I'll read Kate's uh, bio and then I will turn it over to her. So as Xavier University's Chief Title IX Officer, Kate Lawson leads the university's efforts to prevent and respond to sex discrimination. Prior to Xavier, she was a staff attorney at the Victim Rights Law Center in Boston, where she represented victims of sexual violence in the areas of education, safety, privacy, employment, and housing. She provides training on campus gender-based discrimination in Title IX across Ohio and nationwide, and has over 19 years in the field. Kate, thank you so much for uh, doing this webinar today, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, Carrie, for having me do the webinar. Um, as Carrie said, I've been with Xavier um, for the last five years as the Chief Title IX Officer, and um, very, be, very glad to be uh, with you this afternoon um, discussing um, pretty, pretty challenging topics. So thank you all for joining. Um, in our time together um, today, um, I won't be reviewing basics or um, able to get into significant weeds of cases, so I do want to point you to additional resources here on the first slide. Um, the first um, comes out of a TICSA, which I'm sure you know many of you are familiar with. A really um, strong white paper. I know many of you are TICSA members, um, so we can access that. I think it's actually uh, publicly accessible. That really gets into some nuances. That I'm going to highlight today. Second of course, is the 2016 ODAG Transforming Ohio Campuses Toolkit in which um, we really got into the weeds around um, best practices in um, intimate partner violence um, situations. So would encourage you to really dig in to that comprehensive resource. And then the last one, um, which uh, some folks may not be as familiar with, is um, an, an organization in Boston um, called the Network Lared, um, and I was in Boston for 11 years and had the opportunity to work with these folks um, who provide um, really uh, strong, comprehensive trainings um, around um, assessing primary aggressor via intake throughout case assessment, management, et cetera, um, in LGBTQIA communities and relationships. And I would um, strongly recommend um, seeking out training and or resources from that um, organization. So I wanted to highlight there. Um, I you know, really would assert, uh, especially I'll, I'll say, um, they do a great job in um, the Network Lared in helping organizations confront and challenge really um, problematic and inaccurate and harmful thinking around sort of the ideas of mutual abuse. Um, and for me, I would really assert um, that having um, this level of training expertise really is no longer optional um, in Title IX staff and leadership. It really is, um, I think, to be expected um, in terms of expertise. Um, again, you know, if we say we understand that intimate partner violence happens to and by all people, then we, of course, then need to be prepared with the skills to properly handle all types of cases. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, um, and Carrie, you can go on to the next 
slide is, you know, please feel free to reach out to me directly anytime if I can ever offer um, support or processing space. Um, I, I think I've, you know, spoken to many, many people over the last five years who are just looking for an ear to run something by. I'm always happy to um, play that role if it's helpful. So um, just laying out really briefly sort of the current landscape we're in, um, I'm, I'm sure all of you, you know, share um, just sort of my observation um, and all of our, I think, common observation that, you know, there's really a hyper focus um, both, you know, by OCR historically and also, you know, in the media or even on our campuses in terms of sort of climate. Um, and what people are focused on, on student-on-student -student sexual assault um, in terms of our work and Title IX itself. And, you know, I think that hyper-focus, at least in my experience here, has really driven resources, you know, where we focus sort of collectively in developing expertise. You know, the sexual assault cases, at least in my world, are particularly uh, those where um, oftentimes and more and more a lawyer is involved, um, cases that may be perceived as the highest profile, potentially perceived as the highest liability um, risks. Um, but for me, uh, personally and professionally, um, some of the hardest cases I've worked on over the last five years um, in terms of actual content are intimate partner violence. So maybe less lawyers, maybe less perceived liability, um, but in my view and experience, um, uh, significantly more challenging circumstances um, and assessment around fairness and safety and appropriate in and measures, et cetera. And I think um, as a community of professionals over the last five years, I certainly have been part of many, many conversations, whether, you know, in conferences or trainings or, you know, just peer to peer on how very complicated um, these particular types of cases are. Um, we know some of the uh, particular challenges around responding to intimate partner violence under Title IX on our campuses. Um, you know, maybe small insular campus communities, and I would offer that even large public campuses um, get small um, in, in a variety of ways, um, depending on the relationship of the two people involved. You know, common spaces, set routines, small or limited social network spaces for students. Um, predictable routines of college, uh, you know, higher education life, which I think adds um, to the intimate partner violence landscape. Um, closed communities, you know, like Greek life and ROTC or athletics or student government association, which make even large campuses um, small, I think, for people who are experiencing intimate partner violence. Um, obviously, you know, electronic avenues, social, medias, how, uh, social media, how those play into um, uh, partner um, abuse um, or, or violence. Um, I think another challenge, you know, the spectrum of behaviors that constitute intimate partner violence and how we, um, how we address that uh, spectrum both in policy and also in implementation and then also in um, sanction. Um, and then, you know, of course, I, I think we can all acknowledge that given the particular dynamics of on, the ongoing dynamics of power and control and fear in intimate partner violence um, relationships, you know, we may see, I certainly have seen here at Xavier, a higher prevalence of individuals reporting, or even if we learn something is happening from another source, um, and the impacted individual um, it, at a higher rate, at least in, in my experience, may request confidentiality and or no further Title IX response and the challenges that that presents um, with, um, in the context of our obligations under Title IX to respond. Um, I think, you know, I've talked to a lot of colleagues about the fact that these cases not only particularly stretch our skills and comfort assessing matters of fairness and equitability and safety, the work we do, but also really push us to confront the tensions between doing compliance, um, which I would define as meeting our obligations under the law, and doing culture change. That is, working towards actually moving the needle on the issue of intimate partner violence. Um, and moving the needle, in my mind, um, is more reporting and accessing of resources and at the very same time less actual offenses or incidents happening. 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, we're doing this work um, in the against the backdrop of a shifting OCR framework, prioritization, posture. Um, for purposes of this conversation, I'm not going to delve into the potential impact of changes from OCR or get into the interim guidance because um, in truth, I don't, at least from my perspective, I don't think it's fundamentally changed our responsibilities and the general, uh, general message I've heard from colleagues across the country is that not many folks are making changes in response to the interim guidance until after the notice and comment period. Uh, so I'll sort of leave that where it is. So what remains um, is, is what has been here for the last seven years, which is that um, we really need to develop comfort implementing our policies and response processes through the lens of competing and sometimes conflicting, um, but certainly um, intention, law, and guidance. Um, it has to be acknowledged that most of OCR's guidance has been focused on sexual violence. They have not given us much on intimate partner violence, which does, in fact, require additional and different expertise and approach. Um, we also have messages in tension from OCR, you know, including simultaneously, right, take prompt and effective action to stop the harassment, remedy its effects, and prevent occurrence reoccurrence, excuse me, at the same time prioritize the reporting party's wishes, desires, if and when they want us to limit our response, and then at the very same time, you know, where there's threat of further harm or violence or where there's imminent community danger to proceed against potentially the reporting party's wishes. So all that is to say this is challenging to be sure, um, but, but that being said, and, and you'll, I'll say this throughout our time today, just because it's challenging doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it well and with best practices. Um, you know, how we might most effectively do intimate partner violence response in our campuses from our approach, our philosophy towards the work to our implementation of concrete components of our response, such as assessing and Im implementing interim measures, that's really what I'm going to focus on today and hope to be a resource for you if I can um, following today, if it's, if it's ever helpful. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Um, so I would assert that building comfort and competency and addressing intimate partner violence on our campuses, um, there really are some foundational concepts that we need to get comfortable with and, and really commit to, um, all of which demonstrate a commitment to work, again, beyond the what of the work, maybe you know, policy language, each case's particular facts, to really lean into the why and how of the work. Um, and those fundamental concepts for me, you know, include acknowledging that intimate partner violence is a public health epidemic that really has significant impacts on education. Now, every person on this call is an expert in that because we see it on the ground. We see how these issues interrupt the educational lives um, of our students. Um, another, you know, crit and this is, a, of course, applies to sexual violence too, but really honing into IPV. Another critical foundational concept is that it's severely underreported, you know, due to some of the pervasive systemic issues around um, intimate partner violence that really still remain. You know, maybe we're seeing them in more sort of stark relief around sexual violence still, but um, I have really found that um, students and employees and families and folks who I've engaged with across campus really have, um, you know, s still some of the um, misinformation about why people stay in intimate partner violence relationships, so on and so forth, the cause, et cetera. Um, and then finally, you know, as I, um, as I mentioned before, um, another sort of grounding principle for me every day when I'm working on these cases um, is to really um, commit to um, being comfortable to go beyond sort of black and white compliance um, and to really um, to continually develop my expertise in this area, um, understand the significant and I would say just really not negotiable value and importance of putting the reporting party or the impacted party in the driver's seat um, for, for the most long-term benefit. Um, and doing so um, really promotes informed decision-making and ultimately, I think, um, drives um, more reports um, around these issues to, to Title IX leadership. Um, and, and doing the work um, rooted in these critical foundation concepts 
um, I think is um, important to, to do that moving the needlework, um, even if we are uncomfortable, um, which we will be um, in this work. Um, and I'm sure uh, many of you have had um, the uncomfortable and, you know, sleepless nights that I have <laughs> doing this work. Um, these are really the cases that, um, that keep me up at night, I, I will say that, but I wouldn't I don't think it would be appropriate. Uh, I, I wouldn't be doing it well if I wasn't um, spending that much thinking time on it. So, you know, moving into, you know, what does it take um, to build comfort and competency to address intimate partner violence with best practice? You know, it, I really feel that um, a commitment to approaching and, and implementing the work with this mindset really requires strong leadership and expertise from Title IX leadership um, it requires developing a shared vision and approach really cross campus from university leadership to the departments that you re we regularly work with um, in the weeds of these cases, you know, from everyone from maybe some of the usual suspects, you know, maybe a law enforcement or, or campus law enforcement, residence life, to maybe some of the less usual suspects, which I've really tried to engage in here, like dining services and, you know, folks who maybe um, aren't usually at the table but really, you know, are, are in the um, daily lives of students and especially when, when a student is sharing campus and shared spaces with the person who's engaging in intimate partner violence with them. Um, certainly takes, you know, institutional leadership buy-in, and let me be the first to say, um, I know that that is easier said than done, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, you know, I think um, these, we would all, I think, agree that these cases can be quite fraught, you know, high-risk situations that are complex and, and quite consequential to everyone involved. Um, and uh, here at Xavier, um, I've had some success, you know, tying my approach to our mission. Um, that's been extremely effective in, in getting that institutional leadership buy-in from our president to the board of trustees. Um, you know, folks who, um, you know, to be honest, have a lot of anxiety around these issues and or strongly held, um, though often less than helpful, uh, views about how we should be doing the work or the approach. Um, so I've, it's, you know, it's been long but important work to um, continually push forward, you know, the, why I think the way we approach the work is valuable and how it drives our mission. Um, you know, I've successfully tried to use allies, including sometimes at other institutions at the same leadership level as the person um, who I may be having, you know, struggles building relationships with to really help me articulate the value and benefit of the approach. Um, we need to have confidence and courage, which I know sounds a little bit hoaxy maybe, but by this I mean um, to have comfort and com competency in, in addressing these cases. Um, I personally feel like Title IX leadership needs to have a genuine belief and understanding that people who experience intimate partner violence are the experts in their own safety and their lives. Um, and as much as we can within our responsibilities, we really want to support what they identify as the best options for their lives, which I know can feel hard and risky um, from maybe a liability or a compliance um, point of view. So it, it takes a bit of a leap of faith and a trust in your own expertise. Um, you know, not, not just in ITV, but in all of our work, you know, if we're doing the work in response to some perceived source of liability, whether that's an OCR complaint or a responding party lawsuit, you know, I think we really increase the chances that we're already wrong-footed and inequitable, so not in compliance with Title IX in our approach. Um, so again, these, these cases require us to assess very challenging concepts on a tightrope. Um, I fully understand the desire for a if this, then that sort of checklist approach. Um, and I'll just be really blunt. These cases are not that, nor should they be, um, which is why working on these issues, it, to be fully transparent, I just is not a good fit for everyone, um, professionally speaking. Mm -hmm. 
Next slide, please. So um, turning to some more concrete pieces, um, you know, in, in my view, um, what needs to be in place to build comfort and competency around addressing intimate partner violence on our campus campuses, um, certainly good written policy, but th that really should be a given um, at this time. You know, w what we need to focus on is the um, competency and excellence and consistency of our implementation. Um, I, you know, I think it's a it's certainly a best practice, depending on the circumstances of the case, of course, that Title IX staff really should have access to and sort of group assessment opportunity with some key players on campus, whether that's general counsel, human resources, student affairs, law enforcement advocacy, to not be making decisions um, in these cases in a vacuum. Um, if I and every, in, in my experience over the last five years, you know, if I and everyone else with whom I have consulted on a, on a intimate partner violence case, you know, whoever is relevant, have had a robust discussion and each of us have left the table um, a little uncomfortable with our outcome, um, we probably came to that correct balanced tightrope decision. Um, let me, let me emphasize here, um, I think to, to do this work well, you really have to have strong relationships um, with the organization and or individuals who have safety planning and advocacy expertise, but particularly safety planning I'll talk about here. Um, over the years, I've heard a lot of Title IX folks um, sort of draw a line in, in their role to say, like, I don't do the safety planning. Um, you know, we, I don't, uh, you know, I don't want to take that on or I don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, you know, we, we have folks who do that either from counseling or from advocacy. Um, and, you know, I, I, I try to push back a little bit on that to say, I really do think it is best practice that Title IX um, staff have strong safety planning skills um, because, um, a student or employee may not engage with advocacy. They may not engage with counseling, and we can't, you know, force them to do so, obviously. And then where where are we, right? So, um, you know, certainly advocates, um, the, the gender-based violence advocates either on our campuses or in the community have more intimate partner violence expertise than I ever will. Um, and um, for me, I don't really believe you can be competent um, or, or um, find excellence in this work in addressing these issues unless advocacy um, is at the table or in the loop. Um, but we know that, you know, we can provide the resources, but for a variety of reasons, all of which are valid because they're the person's experience, they may, you know, some people don't work with advocacy. And so around safety planning, I would just encourage folks to get comfortable um, with, with those skills, because you may end up being the only person that this, this individual talks with, and we don't want to leave that um, unaddressed. Um, so in terms of, you know, what, what I think needs to be in place, you know, doing the work with these components that I just shared in place um, may slow the investigative process. It may create some discomfort to those who feel the institution is exposed in some way by not responding immediately, not investigating immediately, not automatically issuing no contact notices, which I'll address in detail, not interim suspending or going to the police, you know, what, whatever these sort of check boxes might be. But um, for me, um, it, is a, it is a best practice to ensure um, through our policies and our implementation and our, our practices that reporting parties, um, that their safety is um, prioritized and that they have the means and opportunity um, to remain, to be as safe as possible through their own assessment. For me, um, that's really the intent and spirit of Title IX and the Clery Act for that matter. Um, even if it doesn't fit OCR's sort of traditional view of notice triggering a prompt investigation in cases where there's threats or risk of further harm if those elements are in play. 
So in sum here, um, developing comfort and competency in these cases um, cannot be deduced to a checklist. Um, for me, it's more of a mentality, a way of doing it, um, which again, I, I, will not, I will not sugarcoat it, is extremely effortful and challenging and seriously makes my brain hurt a lot of the time. Um, but it really is the only way um, I think we can um, do our work in a way that um, honors the complexity of these situations and, and trusts the reporting party to, to know their lives best. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So let me share um, some specific practices and examples um, of, of sort of um, doing the work in this way that, that I've put into action here at Xavier. So around intake, a couple of examples. You know, when I, um, when a situation, uh, when I became aware of a situation through whatever um, notice um, process, in my initial outreach um, to the individual, um, you know, I really try in an email, um, I, and in person, of course, but if it's in an email um, in particular, um, I really try to acknowledge um, very proactively in that email that that person is in the driver's seat um, and that specifically, and this has made a huge difference here with sort of getting people to come to talk with me, which, you know, and I think we all agree that in-person moment is so helpful to establish some trust and rapport. Um, you know, I'm real specific to say, or explicit, I should say, um, I can support you in a variety of ways, even if you decide what is best for you at this time is to stay in the relationship. Um, and, and many students in particular have talked about that, that sort of acknowledging that right in the email um, is what sort of brought them um, to feel comfortable to meet with me. Um, a second piece, in, you know, in intake, um, even in the cases where we're anxious and scared and hearing safety issues that um, are of great concern to us, um, I, I have been willing to take my foot off the gas um, of response, whatever that looks like, that maybe would make me feel better, um, uh, and to, to, to try to build in a little bit of time um, to establish trust and rapport, you know, to let the person process the information, talk to their people, friends, family, you know, people who feel supportive to them, um, let alone eat sleep, um, you know, get their academic um, and mental health support pieces in order. Um, I think um, none of us should expect students or employees to have to make significant life decisions, which may have significant safety um, uh, consequences um, after 10 minutes of hearing their rights, options, and resources from a relative stranger. Um, I don't care how good you are, you know, th that's a lot of information to digest. So it, that's a, you know, a little bit uh, how, how this sort of plays out in intake. Around assessment, um, you know, assessing interim measures, options, determining whether I'm going to proceed without a reporting party um, in the face of a request that I not do so. You know, the, the key here for me, again, is that um, uh, there's no sort of automatic action or checklist, no sort of, um, you know, automatic pilot um, actions. I, I, again, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I, I really want to um, commit to letting the reporting party lead um, with the knowledge and the experience, at least here at Xavier, that doing so in the end um, gives them space to actually consider their options. And um, even if in that first meeting they leave saying, you know, I'm not really sure what I want to do and I'm dealing with my own anxiety about that, that space has often, more often than not, allowed the person to, to come back to me to say, you know what, I've slept on it, um, I've had a chance to digest what we talked about, um, and I, you know, I think I do want to pursue that protective order or whatever it is um, that, that they've obsessed. Um, I think we need in assessment um, a lot of flexibility um, in these cases as they evolve. And, you know, I'm sure like me, you've had cases that have looked one way at 9 a.m. and looked totally different at 5 p.m. and to be pretty nimble 
um, it, as, as circumstances evolve, which we know they can evolve quite quickly um, in these circumstances, a willingness to, to, to make the effort to revise and revisit, um, which of course is harder, but certainly the right thing to do. Um, you know, as uh, just an example, you know, I've certainly had a case of intimate partner Violence reported in which, you know, I initially assessed at, you know, 9 a.m. that the respondent, you know, based on the situation, the respondent needed to be removed from their residence hall. Um, and then as the reporting party's assessment of their own situation and safety evolved, um, you know, expressed clearly that the removal of the responding party was increasing their safety risk. So I would revise that interim measure. Um, so it's a lot of hoops um, to go through, but um, I've sort of made peace with um, as long as I'm documenting, and I'm a big documenter, as I'm sure all of you are, you know, documenting, documenting the changing circumstances and the rationale um, that it's better to be nimble and flexible and respond to evolving circumstances than kind of be stuck or like, nope, this is what we decided and this is what we're sticking with. I think that's where we can get into a little bit of hot water um, and certainly away from best practices in these, um, in these cases. Um, you know, when, when we're assessing um, risks around different actions of the, um, uh, that, that the uh, reporting party has um, reported to us, you know, we need to prioritize um, that that person have access to an advocate who can help them consider those complex issues, even if it pushes out our timeline a little bit. Um, when we're assessing risk um, to the broader community um, of a responding party, you know, I think we want to be careful about making assumptions about what the responding party may or may not do, um, but rather use the particular facts, history, our expertise, and then, of course, our most valuable resource, the reporting party, um, to make clear-eyed um, uh, assessments about the risk to the broader community. Um, in situations when a reporting party wants us to take a lot of interim action around the responding party, which maybe is an experience that, that you've had, you know, we want to discuss that with our team, um, the, the sort of core people that you work with, um, again, to sort of make sure we have the right people at the table assessing um, the situation to think through, you know, what specific ways via what systems will we implement? Um, will we and how will we support a responding party's access to their education if we do assess that significant housing, academic, activity, campus restrictions need to be in place while the process is pending? You know, I've been, you know, I've been to the Xavier Library to pick up a video for a respondent at 9 o'clock at night, delivering it to them at Starbucks, um, you know, while a process was pending, and I had removed that person from campus, um, but they had not been found responsible for any violations. So there's, you know, it's kind of a um, approach to say, you know, when we take an interim measure, um, you know, we're doing that based on our assessment of sort of X, Y, Z, and, you know, what, what are we willing to to do and what are we going to do, um, you know, to, to sort of um, address responding parties' rights as well. And it, again, it, it takes a lot of effort there. Um, of course, um, you know, something I think we talk about as a community um, quite frequently, you know, when a reporting party requests confidentiality or no further response, you know, how will we assess what are the reasonable steps to respond to what we know um, within the parameter um, of the confidentiality request? Um, you know, I can think of two cases this year um, which were right in that scenario. And, um, you know, I did significant sort of behind the scenes work, again, honoring that person's request for confidentiality um, with our um, prevention education folks, residents life, you know, keeping the circle quite tight and really sharing very, no information in terms of specifics of the parties to maximize exposure of intimate partner violence prevention education, information, programming, um, promotional materials to the responding party by, you know, assessing where does this person live, work, have classes and participate in extracurriculars to really amp up their exposure because that was sort of the limit um, that I had, um, but, but being really creative 
about how we get that information. And, you know, again, that is not to say person goes to a program and realizes they've been abusive in their relationship, but within the, the reasonable, you know, steps we can take, um, really being creative and partnering across campus, um, again, in, in a tight um, group to, to maximize exposure to education to potentially impact their behavior since we don't have that investigation tool. Um, and then, of course, you know, finally, you know, if we can honor um, reporting parties' requests and decision and take it at their pace, they really are, and this has just been my experience, I'm not sure if it's yours, um, much more likely to develop comfort pursuing additional avenues as they get the support they need, whether it's, you know, counseling, housing, you know, change in their work schedule, whatever it is, as things start to get stabilized through our response, th there may be more mental space to think, you know, what, what would it be like if I did an investigation or reported to the police, you know, police, whatever it might be. Um, so, so turning to best practice um, tips sort of in action, um, um, let me um, visit some of the, the pieces here. Um, I have found, uh, I don't know if you've had this experience over the last five years, there's a lot of conversation about the issuance of no contact notices um, in these intimate partner uh, violence scenarios. Um, and I think, you know, what I'll say here is our our expertise in intimate partner violence um, tells us real clearly, clearly um, that we can actually increase safety risks to reporting parties um, when we issue no contact notices in intimate partner violence situations. So we really need to be deliberate and intentional and quite well informed in our use of no contact notices in these cases. Um, First, you know, we, we know from a variety of sources, including the Office for Civil Rights itself, that automatic issuance of mutual no contact notices, which I'm going to address first, um, when IPV is reported is not, a, is not a best practice. You know, at best, it can make the reporting party feel like they've done something wrong and create a chilling effect for other reporters. Um, at worst, um, obviously, it can actually raise safety risk for the reporting party and be experienced as retaliation potentially. Um, really important that Title IX uh, leadership and staff have the skills and expertise necessary to assess a request and or need for a no contact notice. Um, you know, I've, I've, many campuses where I've done training or, or a shared conversation on this um, have explained to me that their policy to automatically issue mutual no contact notices um, is, is because some reporting parties contact the respondent, the responding party post issuance of that no contact notice and they felt that really complicated matters. What I would offer and, and have offered in a lot of different training spaces is if you have that concern, which is valid, um, I would suggest that you mitigate that concern by having a proactive conversation with both parties, but certainly with the reporting party, um, that if, if they contact the responding party after the no contact notice is issued, that we will need to reassess the need for the no contact notice if that happens and that contact is confirmed. So you kind of lay the groundwork. Um, I think we also have to, you know, in addition, approach this particular issue um, with the, con the context that we know that some um, contact of the respondent by a reporting party um, can be a very common response of someone who is surviving or has survived intimate partner violence um, to if they assess that that is um, going to increase their safety. Um, so I just think we want to be pretty um, thoughtful and nuanced and again um, not have an automatic um, policy that says we issue mutual no contact notices and um, I am aware that that's a common practice um, and I'm certainly happy to, to talk to folks um, um, offline if that would ever be helpful, if that's something you're considering, excuse me, revising. Um, second, um, even automatic issuance of a no contact notice to the responding party only, not mutual, um, again, can really significantly raise safety risk um, to the reporting party. So we, of course, want to you know, consult with the expert, and that's the reporting party, uh, partner with them, uh, and that's really how I see myself, partner with them to assess the impact, effectiveness of this particular measure. 
Um, of course, if there's an advocate in the mix, um, which is, of course is ideal, um, they, they could be part of that conversation as well. You know, obviously, if, if, if the reporting party assesses that the no-contact notice is a, a good, effective um, interim measure, then let's issue it. Um, but if not, if, you know, I have had students say to me, if you issue this no-contact notice, you are making me less safe, um, then I, I, I strongly feel we need to respect that. Um, you know, many colleagues have said to me, what if we don't issue the no-contact notice and the responding party ends up hurting the reporting party? Very important question to ask, but the other just as important question to ask, uh, which I have found that many schools um, don't sort of weigh against that initial question is, hey, what if we issue this no-contact notice automatically with no careful safety assessment or go against a direct request of a re reporting party not to, respondent receives the no contact notice, knows and believes the reporting party has reached out for help and then hurts them in that scenario. Um, you know, I think surely we should care about both um, and carefully assess both possibilities um, with the reporting party's expert opinion um, right there in the forefront, um, not, uh, not assessing what we think is best for that person. Um, and then finally, you know, in cases in which we don't issue a no contact notice, or frankly, even when we do, um, we shouldn't put all of our eggs in that basket in any case. Um, we all, you know, have heard and been trained around like, hey, like it's just a piece of paper. And, you know, it, it, while violating a no contact notice that is university or, or college issued, um, certainly may have, you know, it may trigger uh, further interim measures, more severe interim measures, and, you know, they may get a non compliance. Um, addition to a, to a conduct process, we know that, you know, we don't have that sort of same, um, you know, arrest power that maybe a court-ordered protective um, order, um, a CPO may have. Um, so I, we always want to be asking um, with the reporting party, what are the other ways we can increase this individual's safety? Um, and I think those strategies can often be found in partnership with advocacy, law enforcement, residence life, um, departments um, that we, of course, uh, need to continually focus on building and sustaining strong relationships proactively, um, not uh, to be built in times of crisis um, or emergency. Um, in terms of civil protective orders, so court issued, um, uh, you know, I have to say I'm, I haven't seen a ton of those here. I think um, in many ways by virtue of the fact that there's that, you know, it's just a heavier lift for the reporting party, um, you know, the potential contact with the person at the 10-day um, uh, hearing I think can be quite off-putting. Um, so you, but but that being said, you may be seeing these court-ordered um, CPOs more than I. And um, the the thing I would say here that actually was very helpful, you know, in my past life at the Victim Rights Law Center as a staff attorney, when I would be seeking a CPO, and I also think it's applicable here. You know, I really think that the best way to have good, um, effective enforcement of a court-ordered CPO on a campus, especially small campuses where, again, um, there may be limited options in terms of moving people or, you know, yardage issues, so on and so forth, um, is really through collaboration and planning. So, um, for example, you know, I have had um, advocates supporting Xavier students who, when they've gone to get a CPO, have, uh, and if the judge is hesitant, um, like, uh, like, I'm not really sure I'm, I want the school to have to deal with um, that the advocate comes with a plan to say, hey, listen, I've talked to the Title IX office um, and we've talked about how we're going to work together to make sure there's enforceability. Um, and then also, you know, having an actual plan um, with residence life or the dining services or whoever it is um, that's going to be in the student space that can help with um, planning around enforceability of a CPO. Um, just a quick note on off-campus conduct um, here, you know, obviously, um, given that we are responsible for responding to, you know, the, the quote, downstream effects um, of intimate partner violence, um, I'm certainly a fan of extending policy, uh, Title IX policy, um, to off-campus conduct since, uh, you know, I can't really think of any instance in which a Xavier student or employee who's experienced intimate partner violence um, uh, and it hasn't impacted their life at Xavier. Um, for me, um, finding ways to not 
not be on notice um, and to avoid having to respond is um, not um, demonstrating a commitment to culture change. Um, obviously, responding to off-campus conduct requires very strong relationships with community partners, entities, organizations, you know, some which may be distilled in writing in the form of an MOU, um, some which may be through sort of mutual training. Um, you know, we have a um, program here in Cincinnati where we're I'm part of a citywide task force that addresses campus gender-based violence, and many of you may have this in your community, that's partnering with the bars in the Cincinnati area to train them um, um, because Xavier students are their patrons um, on how to respond um, to these issues if they saw intimate partner violence in their space, um, in their venues, and, and building relationships with those community entities um, really helps us to get a, um, a sense of what's going on in terms of off-campus um, uh, behavior. So I think that is my last slide. Um, I'm certainly, yeah, it is. Um, so I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. Um, Carrie, if there's anything that I didn't talk about that you wanted me to, um, this is the slide I would have done in person. Um, but certainly, you know, we have 13 minutes. Happy to, to answer questions or do whatever makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, everyone, you do have a chat screen on your computer. So if you want to type in a question that you uh, would like to ask Kate or anything that you would like to share um, in the space. It's a little hard to do it over a webinar because, you know, everybody can jump in at once, but uh, certainly want to lend that time um, to you all. So we'll give it a few minutes and see if anybody um, has anything they'd like to add. I'm much more patient being comfortable with silence in a room of people versus over the phone <laughs> <on> a webinar. <laughs> uh, but I'm not seeing anything come up. I know uh, Kate has shared throughout the presentation that, you know, reaching out to her to discuss things or to other colleagues that you trust to discuss things to, uh, to build that um, decision-making and understanding and competency components I think is really critical and important. So, oh, wait, what? We do have a question, Kate. So no. what particular? What particular steps do you take to market your services to students and encourage staff to report domestic violence issues to you? Wow, okay. So um, that, is a, that is a broad question. Um, so um, I do um, very comprehensive um, training and education of, of students, faculty, and staff. Um, so it's really sort of multiple dosage, um, multiple mediums. So um, I'll, I'll start with students. You know, we're talking about these issues um, and I am having FaceTime with students. And again, you know, um, I'm a one person shop um, here at Xavier uh, for all intents and purposes. Um, so really trying to, to um, engage with students face-to-face -face, um, from the moment they step on campus through our very intensive orientation process to meeting them where they are in classes, um, you know, in their club sports, like places they already are because I think you would all agree that if I said like, hey, students, come to an intimate partner violence workshop, ain't nobody coming. Or maybe the, the same 50 students every time. Um, so I really try to be strategic to figure out sort of where students are anyway and then partner with those, um, you know, with faculty and 
staff to integrate this information where they already are in different orientations or trainings. Um, I, am, I have had a lot of success um, tr sort of really strongly training student leaders on these issues um, to have those peer-to-peer -peer conversations. We have a peer education, a gender-based violence peer education group that I partner with quite closely to make sure that they're getting this message out to their peers. So I really try to step back um, and sort of look past the usual suspects. Those things are happening anyway, RA training, you know, kind of the things that we have right in the wheelhouse, but really look at where are the other spaces where, you know, students are gathering or, or where I have a captive audience, uh, frankly, and then also really being um, intentional about leveraging student leaders like in the student government association or peer mentors or whatever it is um, with faculty and staff I'll you know I'll just say say briefly you know I do an online training probably like the rest of you do that's about two hours long on these issues um, what I usually say to faculty and staff is uh, you know, I think online training sometimes raise more questions than they answer. And so I sort of make it my um, part of my job to get FaceTime with as many faculty and staff members as possible to really have some Q&A and run some scenarios. Um, there's a lot of anxiety around these issues, understandable anxiety. Um, and I really want to be accountable to Xavier's staff and faculty and students, but staff and faculty um, to, to to give them really concrete um, hypotheticals and let's talk about, you know, that experience you had last year. So um, I've made it clear to this community over the last five years that I am willing to come pretty much anywhere, anytime with any number of people um, because it really, for me, it is one person at a time. So whether it's 10 minutes at the end of a department meeting or a two hour training for all of student success coaches, um, I'm really looking to have um, not just um, sort of um, checking the box, but like quality, um, in-depth training opportunities that is not a one-off, but is integrated. Um, and that's where I've had some success over the last five years where, you know, some of the faculty and staff who you might not ordinarily um, think would have Title IX training, um, you know, like admission staff or um, the students who do our tour guides um, have had FaceTime with me and regularly do to make sure that they really understand the nuances. And again, I always say it, it's not that you have to be, you faculty, staff, students have to be an expert in Title IX, but we need to have an expert relationship because if, if, if gender-based violence happens to, to someone here, they're not coming to me, they're coming to you, right? Friends, faculty, staff, um, you know, people they have trust and rapport with. So it's really on me um, to develop the relationships with students, faculty, and staff. Most of my referrals, as I'm sure um, yours do, come through other people, not directly to me. So that's the lens through which I approach the work. Awesome. Um, did see any other questions come up? So um, as I was starting to say before, I'm sure um, Kate would be willing to um, discuss with any of you any more um, specific situations or issues you don't want to voice over a webinar, especially a recorded webinar, um, as well as, you know, you all have colleagues and groups that you're building up relationships with through um, many different venues. Uh, but thank you. Um, don't hesitate to reach out and thank you, Kate, for your time today and for doing this presentation. Um, important work that our campuses are doing and I know it really probably helped reframe the conversation and dialogue this summer for a lot of them. So thank you. You bet. Thank you. Yep, everyone have a great day. Thanks for joining us today.